Yes, guys. So let's try to understand what do we include in cost of invent. We are trying to measure the cost of inventory and in the cost of inventory, what are the inclusions and exclusions have to be understood very, very carefully. When we are looking at cost of inventory, understand the inclusions include three things. The first one is cost of purchase. The second one is cost of conversion. The third one is other cost, which we'll try to explain later on. So we are looking at these three things, cost of purchase, cost of conversion, and other cost. Now looking at these three inclusions, let's see what each one has in stock. When I'm looking at cost of purchase, cost of purchase includes my purchase price reduced by the amount of trade discounts, if any, which were offered added by the amount of non refundable taxes. When I use the word non refundable taxes, it signifies the taxes for which input tax credit is not available. ITC is not available. If ITC is available, then we are not supposed to add the input tax credits into your cost of purchase. So only where income ta input tax credit is not available, you are calling them as non-refundable taxes, which are added to the cost of purchase. Plus, loading plus transportation which includes transit insurance at the same time I can also include all other expenses until the goods reach the purchaser's premises. Understand the inclusions now. I'll tell you how I've actually designed it. In a practical situation, a cost of purchase starts from the supplier's premises where I go and I purchase the goods until such goods reach my premises. Once the goods reach my premises, I will stop my cost of purchase. I'll tell you what we have done here. It is a purchase price, the price which is first quoted initially by the supplier Upon, upon certain negotiation, there are some volume rebates and trade discounts which are offered and such things has to be deducted at the time of sale, added by the taxes which are not refundable for which input tax credit is not available should be added to them. And now I have to transport the material from the supplier's premises to my premises. So first I need to load the goods into the vehicle, loading costs. Now the vehicle will start and will start moving towards the factory premises. So there is a transportation cost. During the period of transportation, I will acquire a transit insurance to make sure that the loss in transit is covered. Transit insurance. All other costs until the goods reach my premises. What could be the other cost? Toll charges. Octroi which can be paid. Incidental expenses. Now sometimes normally what we have is Let's say we have a 16 metric ton lorry. Okay, the lorry capacity is 16 metric ton. But I have about 18 and a half metric ton of material to be transported. So what we try to do, why should I even take a bigger lorry? I will dump the entire 
material into the 16 empty lorry and the lorry driver says no problem sir I'll handle so we normally come across that situation where the back side of the lorry is normally open because it is overloaded with the goods and that is a punishable offense you are normally charged or the the uh, the police normally charge these people are something called as open door charges so when it is not closed there is certain penalty that you pay such penalty if it is paid in the transit up to the premises of my customer of my premises then i will include it in the cost of purchase let's say the lorry was traveling or were over speeding such over speeding was normally caught by the police and the police charged a penalty on that such penalty will also get included in the cost of purchase remember there is certain cost which is called as weighment weighment or we normally know it as dharam kanta this word is normally dharam kanta in a, a very colloquial business language but in a very polished way we normally know it as a weighment charge weighment charge is very compulsory because the supplier said sir this is 18 metric ton how do you know it is 18 metric ton by looking at it i can't even visibly say that it is 18 metric ton so we need to go for a weighment charge so the lorry normally goes and stands on a particular uh, on a particular equipment the equipment takes the weight of the lorry with the material will reduce it by the weight of the lorry without that material and finally will say sir this is the weight of the material which is an approximation because in simple sense a full tank lorry will definitely have a different value than a, a, a almost a, a lorry which is almost empty in tank so you need to understand that there is a certain amount of approximation but at least you will get to know to what extent am i actually buying the goods such weighment charges will also be included in the cost of purchase that is why i said all other expenses until the good reach the purchaser's premises i bought the good so until they reach my premises i will add all the expenses incurred got it cost of conversion cost of conversion means when this raw material is put into a production process and become a finished goon this production process whatever cost involved is called as cost of conversion such cost of conversion when we are talking about understand in general sense this cost of conversion is called as factory overheads such factory overheads are classified into two types one we call them as variable overheads other one which we call them as fixed overheads when we talk about this variable overheads this variable overheads are absorbed on the basis of actual production when i'm talking about fixed overheads this is generally absorbed on the basis of normal production when i use the word normal production i intend to say that it is a production after taking into consideration the normal layover time so normal idle time is calculated based on which i identify something called as normal production actual production is the production which is actually done at that point of time based on which i absorb my variable overheads now these are two certain classifications that we give now i don't have to emphasize more on variable overhead but i will put an emphasis on this fixed overhead component i'll tell you why for example let's say the fixed overheads came up to about 1 lakh let's say the normal production capacity of the industry is about 
five hundred units. Then I can say that the absorption rate can be given as two thousand per unit. Sorry, two hundred per unit. I can say that the absorption rate is two hundred per unit. Now let us examine the situation. If I am drafting out like this, and let's say the actual production in two cases, case one and case two, I'm saying in case one I have four hundred and fifty units being produced. In the second case, I have six hundred units being produced. Now observe. If I take two hundred rupees per unit, then the overheads absorbed in each case will look like this. Here, two hundred rupees per unit at four fifty units, I'll get ninety thousand. Here, six hundred units into two hundred rupees per unit, I get one lakh twenty thousand. Now observe what is happening here. What was the fixed overheads actually? One lakh. How much did I absorb? Ninety thousand. This is a case where I get under absorption. What is the actual fixed overheads? One lakh. How much did I absorb? One lakh twenty. Not possible because this is over absorption. These are two extreme situations which can arise out of absorption of fixed overheads. That is the reason why, when we are talking about fixed overheads, we have to be very, very careful because I can have two situations which can arise: one where the actual production exceeds my normal production. This case would result in something called as overabsorption. In the case of overabsorption, we revise the absorption rate. Based on normal production. I'm sorry. Based on actual production, the second situation that can arise is when my actual production. is less than the normal production in this case it leads to under absorption when it leads to under absorption such amount is charged to pnl under absorbed overheads are normally charged to pnl So these are two situations that can arise. The first situation I am saying where normal production exceeds my normal uh, actual production exceeds normal production. Second situation where actual production is less than the normal production. So I give rise to two situations. One is overabsorption and one is underabsorption, and the treatment is as such. So this case where it is underabsorption, the underabsorbed overheads are ten thousand. I have absorbed ninety. The actual is one lakh. There is ten thousand rupees of underabsorption which happened. Such ten thousand rupees of underabsorbed overheads will be charged to PNL. In the other case, overabsorption situation, one lakh is my overheads. I have absorbed one lakh twenty. In this situation, out of the one lakh twenty, since I have extra absorbed twenty thousand, which is not possible, I will revise the absorption rate. What on what basis do I revise? I'll revise it based on actual production. What is your actual production? Six hundred. What is the total fixed overheads? One lakh. So what is the revised rate? 
1 lakh divided by 600 so whatever rate that you get you get normally i guess 167 rupees or 166.66 that will be my revised absorption rate when we are seeing the product when we see that the actual production exceeds the normal production now this in a sense is what we understand under cost of conversion since i do not have enough space i will take another board to uh, you know explain about other cost but before we go into other cost we'll also have to look at another thing called as joint products and byproducts which will be also be a component of cost of conversion so look at the cost of conversion the entire cost of conversion component cons concepts are derived based on your costing logics or majorly based on your cost accounting so please make sure that you are understanding the logic more in essence because these are the same ones which we also have in your cost accounting clear Yes, guys, continuing with the valuation of cost of inventory, we have to see under cost of conversion. I'm still sticking to the cost of conversion itself. And we are saying that there is a component where there is a very interesting concept that arises because of joint products and byproducts. I'll tell you why. A, B and C are different materials there is certain labor cost which is involved in this plus certain overheads which are involved in this and here I have something called as joint cost a combined cost of all this from the entire manufacturing process let's say I have two products X and Y. These are two products from manufacture. Or the production process. Now the question arises, how do I distribute the cost? How should I distribute the cost, the entire joint cost? How do I distribute it to these two products, X and Y? That will be the question. Now, for us to answer this question, this is a very interesting question. It depends on whether X and Y here are joint products or byproducts. When we have a joint cost, the joint cost has to be distributed among the joint products. or byproducts if they are joint products that means both of them are significant in value then in such situation it should be allocated on the basis of the ratio of their realizable value at split off point. The standard says it should be done on a reasonable and consistent basis. Reasonable and consistent basis is the words used in the standard. A reasonable and consistent basis can be taken as realizable values at split off point. But if I am looking at byproducts per se, in the case of byproducts, then the allocation happens here like this. The byproduct should be valued at realizable value so no ratios nothing and the main product of manufacture will be given as joint cost minus the realizable value of byproduct
This is what is emphasized as per the standard, but it is difficult to assess the situation. Here I am splitting it. Joint product is measured at its realizable value, while the main product is valued in this way. Let's try to understand with the help of an example. Let's say the joint cost up to the split off point up to split off point let's say the joint cost was about 60,000 rupees at this place I got two products A and B A I got 60 units and the realizable value was let's say 400 rupees per unit B I got 100 units let's say the value was 500 rupees per unit If I assume that these are joint products I'll take something more uh, reasonable or it's okay if it is a joint product then I'll have to take the ratio of A's to B what is the ratio of A's to B here look at the realizable values 60 into 400 is to 100 into 500 that means I'll get a ratio of 24 is to 50 so my entire 60,000 should be allocated to A and B in this ratio so A will be 24 by 74 B will be 50 by 74 this is my ratio in which I will divide if I am saying that these two products A and B in the joint phase or the split off point are considered as joint products but if I consider them as byproduct and let's say A is the byproduct then in such situation A will be measured at its realizable value what is the realizable value here 60 into 400 that is 24,000 B which is nothing but the main product like we called it should be given as 60,000 minus 24,000 36,000 will be the cost of B observe the valuation premise has changed predominantly if I consider it as a byproduct or a joint product. Now that is what we are saying when we are talking about cost of conversion and this is a very interesting concept which is built into your joint products and byproducts per se. Now this will bring us to the end of cost of conversion. But before I stop, someone has to answer this question, how will I decide whether a particular product is a joint product or byproducts that I've got at split off point? Now, that answer of let's say I have multiple products at split off point to identify which one should be constituted as joint products, which one should constitute as byproduct, I will have to go as per the intention of the management. Management intention is to produce diesel. Let's say I want to produce biodiesel. Biodiesel arises from palm oil. Such palm oil if it is done in a manufacture process, I get biodiesel. At the same time, I also get glycerin. The glycerin was never my intention to produce. My intention to put it in the manufacturing process was basically to derive diesel. In such case, we will have to make sure that the glycerin will be considered as a byproduct should always be measured at its realizable value. While the main product, which is the diesel, should be calculated as joint cost or the total cost minus the amount of realizable value of byproduct. Sometimes there can be a situation 
where I have a manufacturing process deriving two products and the management did have an intention to produce both the units. I can easily identify a byproduct, but I cannot really identify a joint product. Why? Byproduct normally has a very low or insignificant realizable value compared to the joint cost. For example, I need a 9 meter rod. That is my manufacturing process. But what is available in the market is 10 meter rod. So I bought a 10 meter rod. I chopped 1 meter out of it. And I said this is my 9 meter rod over the manufacturing process. Now when I got the 9 meter rod, unfortunately I was still left out with a small bit of 1 meter rod. That 1 meter of rod which is still left out, which we call it as byproducts. Because that was never my intention to manufacture. And remember, the value of this 9 meter rod will be very high compared to that 1 meter rod. The reason being, it is re it's a byproduct and it is arising incidentally in the manufacturing process and the enterprise never had an intention to manufacture that 1 meter rod. It came incidentally in manufacture of the 9 meter rod. Got it? So these are simple understandings of how I identify between a joint product and a byproduct. It's a very interesting understanding, a very interesting illustration to be put across. 24 by 74 and 50 by 74, it happened because I took random numbers and you can still calculate based on 60,000 if you have a calculator, right? So yes guys, we were talking about cost of inventory. Under cost of inventory, we had one more discussion to be made that was regarding other cost. What is this other cost which should be included in the cost of inventory? The other cost to be included in the cost of inventory basically is all such cost incurred to bring the asset to its current location and condition. Now when we look, say the word current location and condition, what exactly am I talking about? Let's say we go to a, a, a dairy farm. In the dairy farm, we are basically trying to take a stock verification. And the store manager said, sir, uh, you know, there's a total amount of 600 uh, liters of production which is there right now in the stock. 300 liters is there in the tank. 100 liters is there in the packing stock. The 100 liters is basically already in a packed condition. This way he is trying to give you a bifurcation and you wrote 600 liters into what is the price. He gave you a cost sheet based on which you have written the value. The answer is absolutely wrong because the 300 liters which were manufactured but still stored in the tank after the pasteurizing process, you cannot value it equal to such value of inventory which is already in a packed condition. Because the amount of packing material cost will get included whenever we are talking about the packed material. Now that is a very very interesting concept to be talked about. Let's say for example, we were involved in a mineral water plant. A mineral water plant, basically we have a unit which is far away from the city. You cannot have a mineral water plant in the city for a reason that, you know, the city population is so high that the underground water level is not too much. So you normally place the plant quite far away from the city and at such part of the city, you, st you started drilling a borewell, you know, about a thousand feet borewell and you started pumping the water into the reverse osmosis process and you started getting something called as mineral water. We call it as packaged drinking water as well. This packaged drinking water went into the process and gave me a tank full of your packaged drinking water. Now these, this water which I have now will have to be stored and basically made sure that they are filled into certain bottles or tins, a 20 litre tin or a 1 litre can and this way we will have to market it. But unfortunate thing is, it is quite far away from the city. I got an order from the city saying that, sir, I need two water cans of 20 litre each. So what do you do? You arrange for a transport, those 20 litre water cans in two number, they were sent out. The cost of those 20 litre can was 6 rupees, but instead you have actually incurred 10 rupees per can only for transporting it, incurred a total cost of 16 for doing the sale. So instead of doing this, what they have understood is, let us try to plan out something different. Let us try to plan a go down, which is there within the city, 
though the entire process is happening in the plant which is situated outside the city from here i will transport the goods into the city and such goods which are shipped at the end of the, at the beginning of the day will be started distributing it as production now what is happening the transportation cost is only incurred once majorly rest of the time it is a very minimal transportation cost which is involved now if you ask me i wouldn't say that the material at the plant and the material at the godown which is in the city both are at the same value due to location there is an increase in the value the increase in the value is because of the transportation cost which was involved in it so all such costs put together we have to understand in other cost other cost we simply say that it is cost incurred to bring the inventory to its current location and condition i'll emphasize upon these words location and condition when we are looking at location let me tell you that whenever i say location it will include transport cost from the plant up to the markets remember guys transportation from the plant up to market remember guys from the market up to customer location this cost if i have incurred any transportation then it should be called as selling and distribution expense it cannot be included in the cost of inventory so what i will include in the inventory is only such cost which is incurred for transportation from the plant up to the marketplace this is what we can understand from current location current condition which i am talking about it includes packing cost when i say packing cost i cannot simply say packing cost and leave it there because there are two types of packing that we can find one is called as primary packing the second one is called as secondary packing what is the difference between both primary packing is the one which is required to make the good marketable to render a good marketable whatever cost you incur is called as primary packing secondary packing in simpler sense is selling and distribution expense i'll give you an example we normally get some additional packing material if you remember now like that kinder joy the chocolate there is a certain toy which is put inside it now as such it is also involved in the packing of the good but such packing is only an additional packing it is not rendering the good marketable it is only to promote your sales that you start doing it such cost cannot be included so secondary packing cost is not included in the cost what is included in the primary packing cost is included in the cost understand guys there are plenty of places where you find actually the secondary packing material now secondary packing material is widely found especially in those uh, chewing gums that we have a chewing gum it has a wrap at the same time also has a tattoo on it now those tattoos which were packed along with it is a secondary packing material 
because they use it for marketing saying that sir we have a tattoo which is given along every time you buy a, a chewing gum i'll give you a tattoo which is free of cost now that is secondary backing now without that particular tattoo can i basically make the good saleable absolutely yes in such situation we'll have to understand the difference between primary and secondary packing primary packing is included while secondary packing is excluded from the cost of inventory this in a sense is concluding the cost concept of inventory when we are talking about inclusions we have seen cost of purchase we have seen cost of conversion and finally we have come down to other cost we'll also have to observe certain exclusions from cost what are the exclusions from cost of inventory whenever i say exclusions from cost understand the first exclusion itself is your storage cost guys remember guys storage cost is generally excluded because the standard believes that storage by itself will not enhance the value of the good but sometimes there can be a storage cost which can be included in the cost of inventory if such a storage will enhance the value of the good included if it enhances the value of inventory what are such things very easy example which we normally get for this is wine wine normally as it the days progress as the years progress it normally tastes better so that is what they say so we have to understand that such kind of issues where the storage cost is enhancing the value of the product then we have to include it take another easier example what we generally tend to see is rice we buy rice we store it and we do not consume the new rice out there we will store it for a period of time because they say that as days progress the rice normally cooks better so that is such cost where it enhances the value of an inventory storage cost can be included the next exclusion is your administration cost administration cost basically cost for administering the entire place like security places security department someone who's head of the administration at that particular factory all such costs will be excluded selling and distribution cost very understandable because selling and distribution do not enhance the value of the product you only promote the product like this now let's say for example boost advertisement you need virat kohli or sachin tendulkar to say that boost is secret of my energy and you buy it now did the value of the product increase because virat kohli or sachin tendulkar was drinking boost or endorsing boost now the product has the same value the product whatever nutrients it had will still have the same nutrients whether sachin tendulkar has drank it or virat kohli has done but they use it for selling and distribution in such situations we would say that it is excluded from the cost at the same time we also have to talk about another exclusion from the cost abnormal losses we will understand this with an example but abnormal losses are normally charged to pnl you do not include it in the cost of inventory at all and the last and final one is finance charges and interest cost interest and finance charges are excluded however this particular thing which i'm talking about here in days 23 what is india's 23 borrowing cost says that if inventory satisfies 
the definition of qualifying asset borrowing cost can be capitalized so it is a violation of india's 2 but understand india's 23 is more specific standard than the general india's 2 standard so india's 23 prevails over s2 where we say that if such inventory satisfies the definition of qualifying asset then though the as2 is talking about exclusion of finance cost it can still be included under india's 23 got it we'll have to examine what this abnormal loss are and how we actually account for them or value these abnormal losses yes guys like we have i told you we have to understand the difference between normal losses versus abnormal losses the treatment difference is very simple that abnormal losses are excluded from the cost of inventory while the normal losses should be included in the valuation of inventory i'd say that normal losses are included in cost of inventory by inflating per unit cost of material abnormal losses are excluded from cost of inventory and charge to PNL now we'll have to understand and examine how this actually happens what is this inflation per unit of material and when do we call it as abnormal loss for let's say example in a particular production process it has been designed like this material 100 units at a price of let's say 6000 labor processing cost let's say about 3000 and there are certain production overheads let's say the production overheads also came up to about 3000 making the total cost of production as 12000 and at the end of this production process let's say i derive output of let's say about 80 units but for suppose let's say if normal loss is equal to 10 percent if i have designed the normal loss like this then the normal output would have been 90 units but what is the actual number of units that you got 80 units so from this we can say that the abnormal loss is 10 units now see how we value it valuation is very very critical guys in this concept now when we are looking at valuation value per unit is equal to 12,000 divided by 90. Observe how much did you get here? I think we get about 133, I guess. Now, observe, guys. Actually, if I got the entire 100 units of output, 
100 units of output for 12,000 rupees would have been only 120 rupees per unit. But since there is a normal loss, I am considering the output of 90 units and I am getting 133. Now understand, value of inventory will now be written like this. 80 units into 133, whatever value you get. So probably the valuation that you should be getting is... One zero six four. But what is the total cost? Twelve thousand. How much is the inventory value? One zero six four. Where is the balance? The balance is nothing but your abnormal loss. Abnormal loss. How you calculate is ten units of abnormal loss at one thirty three rupees is basically my abnormal loss that comes to about one thirty three rupees. So it's something like that. So you will get the value accordingly. There is some approximation which is involved, so that is the reason why you will get about 3 or 4 rupees of difference. But this is 1330 thir rupees of abnormal loss that you normally record. So this is 10,000. Yes, guys, so about 1330 rupees of loss is what you get. So this is basically what we are talking about when you look at abnormal and normal losses. This is how we identify it and how we recognize and measure abnormal and normal losses. Inventory will become an asset while the amount of normal loss will be charged to P&L as losses. Got it? Now, once we have understood normal and abnormal losses, you have to understand that there's typically a different way in which we identify the value of inventory or measure the cost of inventory. We call it as cost formula. Now, what is this cost formula talking about? For us to understand this cost formula, we'll have to divide the inventory into two types. What are these two types of inventory that I'm trying to divide? not ordinarily interchangeable goods not ordinarily interchangeable goods and ordinarily interchangeable goods What is the difference that we are talking about here? When we say not ordinarily interchangeable, such not ordinarily interchangeable goods are such goods which you can specifically identify. For example, let's say a person has purchased, let's say it's standard rods. Steel rods were purchased. First he got 100 units of steel rod, each one purchased at 50 rupees per rod. Out of which 80 were already issued for production. Again, he bought 120 rods. Now, this time he bought it at 55 rupees. Out of which again he issued 70 for production. He was still left out with 50. Again, he purchased a few more rods. Let's say this time he purchased about 50 rods. Each one valued at 48 rupees. Now, at the end of this, I remove one rod and I asked him, Sir, what is the cost of this rod? He'll say, Sir, I bought it in three lots. First time I bought it at 50, second time I bought it at 55, third time I bought it at 48. The rod which you picked up, I don't know at what cost I bought. It should be among these three. Take an average of all the three, then you have to say it is possible. So you cannot really value it so vaguely. So you need to understand that such kind of inventory are ordinarily interchangeable goods. For example, let's say, take an issue which is very relatable to us in our house. Go to your mom ask her mom this jewelry which you are wearing where did you buy it from when did you buy it from from whom did you buy at what price did you buy she will tell you each and every detail she'll exactly tell you that this jewelry which i bought was at the time of your mama's chacha's brother's wedding and this was basically given by your dad however i went and he did not come and there's one more complaint which comes around 
and there's an entire story which revolves and he she'll be very specific on whether the jewelry person has actually given her some discount or not or whether she he he has treated him her well or not whether cool drink was provided or not she'll be that specific about it she'll be very specific now go to your kitchen pick up pick up one spoon go to your mom and ask mom when did you buy where did you buy how much did you buy and who did who paid for it yeah, i don't know man we must have bought spoons multiple times and one spoon which you picked up i really cannot tell you what exactly is the value of that particular good what do you think has changed now same person you were the same person asking her you are, and it is her belongings you are asking her a question she is able to answer for one the other one she is not able to answer the logic is very simple not ordinarily interchangeable goods are normally very high in value and very low as far as volume is concerned while ordinary interchangeable goods are exactly reversed they are low in value but they are very high in volumes this is basically the pattern of how we design the goods now what we are trying to say here is when you are applying a cost formula for goods which are not ordinarily interchangeable such goods we have to adopt specific identification method we apply something called as specific identification means what you will specifically identify the good at what price you have bought it from how many units you have bought it you can specifically identify i pick up one good i'll say i bought it i bought this on so and so date from so and so person supplier at so and so price specific sometimes i might not be able to identify so specifically in such case i will not apply a specific identification method here i will try to apply something called as fifo or weighted average remember guys your lifo or average cost both of them cannot be adopted at the time of valuing your inventory i'm saying that neither your lifo can be adopted nor your average cost can be adopted in valuing the inventory even if it is ordinarily interchangeable you have to compulsory follow only fifo or weighted average method no other method can be used in this case got it so fifo is nothing but first in first out weighted average basically you have to multiply the number of units purchased with the unit price add everything and then divide it by the total number of units this is weighted average cost now this is understanding of cost formula i'm not getting too much into fifo and weighted average because we are more talking about how the valuation should be done and what and why not how we have to actually use the fifo and weighted average this was cost formula we have something else called as technique of measurement of cost what is this techniques of measurement of cost your techniques of measurement of cost basically indicates how do you identify the cost of a particular good uh, sir what is that i bought it i know what is the price of it very good absolutely agree that you bought it you know what is the price of the good but unfortunately let's go into a retail store and examine the things let's go to the shampoo segment men shampoo women shampoo common shampoo for both men and women i have products of hb hb hul i have pro products of pamole of india i have products of some xyz company patanjali i have multiple products which are there one says amla one says shikaka one says something else now each company is producing multiple levels now if you basically look at the entire lot of goods only in the shampoo section i have about 10 different manufacturers each one producing 20 20 different types of goods each one cost was different now this was only with respect to shampoos you go to again a toothpaste segment one with salt one with clove one without salt one without clove one with entire ayurvedic aushad and everything now so many types men and that to understand it is the same manufacturer who produces it but when there are multiple varieties of goods which you have 
my identification of cost with respect to each good if i keep on doing understand what is a list being populated man you go to a retail supermarket and start preparing the list number one so and so company so and so product number one number two so and so company so and so product so so and so flavor in that particular company now like this if i start preparing how long is the list gonna come the list is gonna be pages and pages and pages being filled up now if i ask you to identify the cost of each particular item it becomes really difficult that is the reason why we'll go for a different technique for cost of measurement one is called a standard cost other one is called as retail method this retail method is also popularly known as adjusted selling price method under this method of adjusted selling price what we try to do is we say that cost is equal to selling price minus estimated gp percentage because normally in a retail industry the selling price of goods are fixed you have a maximum retail price for such goods such maximum retail price i am deducting it with the amount of estimated gp estimated gp might not be common for every product but similar products always have similar gp when i look, i look at a retail segments and i identify the gp the examination of gps can simply be understood that the trend analysis if you take a certain set of goods have 10% gp certain set of goods have 20% gp certain set of goods will have 50% gp certain goods will have 100% gp i can classify the goods and i can say maximum the grouping will be about 10 at the max 10 classifications is what i get when we are using a gp method this is called as adjusted selling price or retail method and this is used in retail industry only used in retail industry while standard cost method is a normal method where we use cost of purchase plus cost of conversion plus other cost this is my normal standard purchase technique this is what we can understand with respect to identification of cost of an inventory our standard cost normally what we adopt in a retail industry specifically we adopt something called as adjusted selling price method or retail method where we identify the cost by deducting the amount of estimated gp from the normal selling price this in a sense will give us an understanding of how the identification of cost happens in the case of inventory that is in days 2 at the same time we'll also have to look at something called as nrv because if you remember we started with the valuation premise and the valuation premise was lower of cost or estimated nrv now when we are looking at estimated nrv how do i value the nrv is basically what the question is and different types of inventory different types of valuations of nrv are normally emphasized upon how we identify the nrv will be the next question that we are going to answer yes guys so once we have understood the cost of inventory let's try to examine what is the nrv of inventory how do we identify the nrv of an inventory nrv stands for net realizable value now to identify the net net realizable value of an inventory first of all understand the definition first the definition said inventory includes your in assets which are held for sale in ordinary course of business that means i said it is regarding your finished goods assets held in the process of production i was referring to wip supplies to be consumed in the production process i was talking about raw material so we'll have to define the nrv of each type of inventory be it finished goods or the wip or the raw material 
Now each one have a typical definition of identifying the NRV. Let's break it up and let's understand. If I'm looking at finished goods, then I will adopt NRV like this. NRV can be given as estimated selling price of finished good reduced by minus estimated cost to sell. Estimated cost to sell is basically the commission which uh, gets deducted at the time of selling or brokerage which gets deducted at the time of sale. So such cost should be reduced from the cost of inventory. That is the first thing. Now when I'm looking at WIP, we'll have to take a different valuation altogether because when we're talking about WIP, you are not holding the work in progress goods for sale. I cannot have estimated selling price of WIP because WIP as such need not have a market at all. It might not be a marketable product where the active market does not exist and I cannot identify the, uh, the selling price of a WIP. Then how do I identify it? WIP, we will take it like this. Estimated net selling price of finished goods. What is this net selling price? This put together is called as net selling price that is nothing but selling price minus estimated cost to sell so I am using the word net selling price that means the same thing reduced by estimated further cost of production that means let's say a product is still yet to finish once I complete the production, then I can sell this finished good for 100 rupees. For me to complete the production, I need to incur another 20 rupees of cost. So my NRV of finished goods can be given as 100 rupees estimated selling price of finished good minus estimated further cost of production 20 rupees will give me NRV of 80. But when we're coming to raw material, understand I'm not holding a raw material for sale. I never hold a raw material for sale that becomes really really important for us to understand and examine what we do with the raw material. When we look at raw material, I'll split the raw material into two types. The first one which is designated to a job, a particular job is being designated to it and other raw materials. When I've designated the raw material to a particular job, I can have two situations which predominantly occur. The first one where we say then the estimated selling price of finished goods is less than estimated production cost. I'm talking about the first scenario this way. I'm saying that the estimated selling price of finished good is less than the estimated production cost. Or sometimes I can say estimated selling price of finished good is greater than the estimated cost of production. Two different ways of identifying the good which is raw material here if it is designated to a particular job if I say estimated selling price of finished good is more than the cost of production that means I am following something called as profit which will be recognized in the future when I sell the good in such situation we will take measure at cost no NRV has to be identified here because it is estimated future profit so we have to adopt something called as conservatism concept. So future profits should not be recognized. So I'm measuring it at cost and I'm leaving it like this. But when I have this way, estimated selling price of finished good is less than the estimated cost of production. In this case, NRV is equal to replacement cost. The cost of replacement 
should be considered as NRV. Even in the case of other raw material, we'll follow the same thing. We will say that NRV is equal to the amount of replacement cost. So here and here, the value replacement cost is being used while the word cost is being used when the inventory is designated to a particular job and is expected to, to be sold above the cost of production. In such case, I'll measure the inventory at cost. In the other two scenarios, I will measure the inventory at replacement cost. Now, this in a sense, we'll discuss about what is the NRV of finished good. Now, in, sorry, in the NRV of inventory. Now, once we are done with the NRV of inventory, we have certain things to understand. The first thing which I want to talk about is consumables versus tools. Very popular account head is consumables and tools or tools and consumables, a very regular account head that we use. The reason was AS2 did not differentiate what exactly is a consumable and what is exactly true. But however, with the introduction of Indias, we have a specific understanding of what is a consumable and what is a tool. For example, let me tell you like this. A consumable is losing its original form in the production process. While a tool aids a production process and can come back in the production process in the same form. For example, let's say I have a cloth manufacturing company and we have designs to be placed on the cloth. Certain patterns are there and these patterns are stored on something called as molds. So a cloth is rolled, I have a mold, the mold comes and presses a design on that particular cloth and the cloth becomes a design cloth. Now this mold which is being used out here, understand there are two things which are functioning in this production process. One thing is the mold, second thing is the ink which is used within the mold. Now. If a production process happens like this and a cloth enters a production process, the mold presses on the cloth a particular design comes out again. Is the mold still there or no? Absolutely. But the ink which is inserted into the mold gets pasted into the cloth. That means it is losing its original form. You cannot get back the ink, you can get back the mold. That is the difference between consumable and tool. Such ink will be called as a consumable while tools are those which will come back again in its original form. So let us try to understand what these are. Consumables by the name suggests get consumed in production process. While tools they do not get consumed, they aid a production process. Now why do I even differentiate this? There is some difference which I have to observe in this. This consumables are governed as per India S2 become inventory while those which aid production process should be capitalized as property, plant and equipment under India 16. Because India 16 definition says an asset which will be used in the process of production or for provision of services. Tools are used in the process of production. They are not consumed in the process of production. You can use the word aid or use in pro used in production process. Got it? So you can say that they satisfy the definition of a property, plant and equipment should be covered under India 16 and not covered as far as India 2 is concerned. Depreciation should be charged on the mould based on the pattern in which you consume that particular tool. Sometimes a few people might recognize depreciation on time basis. Sometimes people might use it on production units basis. Sometimes people might recognize on number of prints basis. So this way we can have multiple examples that we can take. Here I can give an example of molds, patterns, dies, etc. Here I can give the example of ink, diesel, etc. 
Now this is what we understand in the case of tools and spares. Now understand guys, one more thing which we have to talk about, which we have already discussed as far as in days 40, in days 16 and in days 36 is concerned is payments deferred beyond normal credit terms. Whenever you have deferred a payment beyond normal credit terms, you have to understand that this is very similar to the paragraphs given in India 16, 40 and 30, 38 intangible asset, property plan and equipment, investment property as well as your intangible assets. What happens in this process? We will have to say that we will have to differentiate the transaction price, the amount of transaction price is bifurcated into cost of goods plus interest cost. We have explained it further in those standards. Please make sure that you refer to those standards on what we are talking about here. Got it? So these are peculiar concepts that we have to understand in your index 2 regarding your cost of regarding your inventory NRV and peculiar concepts regarding tools, consumables and payments deferred beyond normal credit terms. Yes guys, so a new concept or a peculiar concept that's going to arise with India S2 is regarding the treatment of reversal of write downs in inventory. What are we talking about in reversal of write down? Let's understand with the help of an example. Let's say in a particular year, let's say year one, just naming the year just like that, the cost of the inventory was about 100, while the NRV of the inventory came up to about 88 rupees. We said we'll have to choose lower of these two. So I'll say that value of inventory is equal to 88 being lower of cost of NRV. Let's say for example somewhere in year 3 I came across like this that now I find that the cost of the inventory became 88 after write down by 12 rupees or let's take it as year 2 only. And this NRV here has increased and now it has become 104. Though we say that the value of inventory is lower of cost of in cost or in NRV, you though you say it is 88, I'm saying now this is not. It is not 88. I'm talking about something called as reversal of write down. So reversal of write down, he says that write down in the value of inventory should be subjected to, should be reversed, subjected to a maximum of write down in the value in previous years maximum it should be reversed only to the extent of the write down which happened so in this given situation, I can say that the maximum write down can hold the reversal is subjected to a maximum of reversal in subsequent periods maximum of 12, which was a write down earlier. So instead of recognizing 
88 i'll recognize 100 104 is also wrong because if you take 104 the reversal is 16 rupees but the reversal should be subjected to a maximum of 12 rupees if let's say for suppose this was not 104 but instead this was about 96 let's say let's say that this narvi was not 104 but it was 96 then in such cases i will also take the value of inventory as 96 only because the reversal is only to the extent of 8 rupees maximum can be 12 if it is less than 12 also it is fine so the reversal can be considered as 96 this is what we can understand in the concept of reversal of write down which is a new introduction as far as index 2 is concerned now along with this concept of reversal and write down one thing which we have to understand the difference between AS2 and AS2 is regarding inventory of service provider. Earlier AS2 excluded the inventory of service provider. But here the AS2 specifically examines and explains what, how to measure and value the inventory of a service provider. Inventory of a service provider normally arises in case of complete service method. of revenue recognition. What is this complete service method of revenue recognition? Revenue can be recognized only if the service is complete and not in parts. Whenever this situation arises, it normally gives rise to WIP of service provider. WIP of service provider in this case can be given like this. WIP of service provider is equal to materials consumed in service plus direct labor wages or salaries plus reasonably allocated cost to the service this is how i can identify wip of a service provider so what are we talking about all the materials you have used in providing that service plus any directly attributable wages or salaries plus all the reasonably allocated overheads or cost to that particular service. This can be given as WIP of service provider. However, it excludes administration cost and selling and distribution cost they cannot be attributable to a particular service. These two costs are specifically excluded from the cost of inventory. Understand guys, this is a very typical concept which has come up because of India's 2. But however, what I wanted to say here towards the end is, India's 2 applies to WIP of service provider, but if such service is classified as construction contract, then India's 2 will be excluding that. If it pertains to construction contract, then it will be excluding service provider, the inventory of service provider concept excludes construction contracts. It clearly excludes construction contracts. Construction contracts, why it excludes, we will understand only when we are dealing with construction contracts. As of now, I am not going to cover that concept. But all I can say is the inventory measurement concept or revenue recognition concept of construction contracts is significantly different. And that is the reason why you find a lot of difference. That is the reason why the WIP of construction contracts is excluded from India's 2.